Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us. Um, today's Quick Bites webinar is all about Ravenous. Here it is. Um, if you haven't yet managed to get hold of a copy, do. Um, it's a brilliant, pacey, entertaining read. And certainly if you've not managed to read the National Food Strategy, it's a great way to dive into a lot of the content that was in the National Food Strategy. Or if you've got a friend that you can't really get to read the National Food Strategy, but might like to know what it's all about, then I can definitely recommend it. I'm obviously quite biased because I worked with Henry on it, but I'm really, really thrilled. I mean, on the National Food Strategy, not the book, but um, I'm really thrilled that Henry's uh, with us today. And I know, Henry, you've had a completely insane week in terms of... Uh, being out and about, talking about the book, talking about the media. So really, thank you for making the no, time today. Talking to you is the highlight of my week, Anna. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, brilliant. Here we are on a Friday morning. Um, so everybody, just to remind you, this is the Quick Bites sort of series that we run, which is just half an hour, a quick chance to do some sort of snap analysis of what's been going on. Um, in the news around food and obviously Henry's been hitting the headlines with his new book this week so we thought it was a really good opportunity to dive into that. So let's start Henry by just I mean obviously your feet haven't really hit the ground this week but um, how's it how's the book landed from your perspective are you pleased with how it's been going and just tell us a bit about your hopes why why you put it into a book what what's your what you're hoping to achieve with it? So as you know, Anna, with, with the food strategy, we, we were quite trying to do two things. We we're trying to change the way people understand the system, and we were trying to get some policies into place. And we got a few policies into place thanks to the campaign you ran with Marcus Rashford. We got something in, in food poverty. We got some of the Leveling Up white paper on education and on community eat well. And we got some of the, the environmental stuff, land use framework and so forth in. But I think we both realized quite quickly that uh, in terms of changing the way people think about the system, the paradigm, very few people are going to go, maybe some people on this call, but very few people are going to go onto a government website and download a government report. And we pretty quickly thought we have to, we've got to get the ideas out there in a more accessible fashion. And that's the point of the book. Um, uh, we are currently number one in agriculture industry. Uh, Jeremy Clarkson... <laughs> Jeremy Clarkson is uh, numbers two to ten. Uh, no, but we we, we uh, it's gone very well. So we the books went up to twenty on Amazon. Where we the the it's been stocked in Tesco, which is just terrific news. Um, you know, because we really want to reach audiences we don't normally reach. The publisher is absolutely thrilled, and you know the 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 reviews have been good. And you know we're 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 pretty excited actually. And I think that the the most the, the best thing that happened to me in terms of, kind of the feedback I got was our indexer. Now, indexers are an incredible bunch. And our indexer wrote to our editor to say it was the first book ever that he'd been reading out bits to his wife in bed. And so <laughs> we tried to make it something you people wanted to share. And so on, you know, on this call, if there are people who you think are interested in these issues but but find the stuff they normally read, uh, um, you know, dry. a bit dry. Please do share it. The, the idea is that it becomes viral. We've also got a publisher in America now who wants to Americanize it and and do it for an American audience because just that fundamental idea about food environment and it not being about willpower, mm. um, it has not landed. It, it, still, the majority of the population don't believe that. And on the environmental side, there's still too much of a fight between land sparing and land sharing, and not enough understanding about how you use your land more in a more patchwork fashion. Yeah, I mean, that I think is what I'm excited about in terms of giving the all the amazing work that went into the food strategy, that longer shelf life in terms of its ability, hopefully, to not just influence UK food policy in the longer term. And as you say, how people, citizens think about the issues, but also potentially to um influence how other countries are thinking about the issue because obviously there's been a lot of international interest in the food strategy and how the UK is sort of going on this journey around food system change um so I'm interested to tuck into a few of the little um I mean I completely uh, wanted to also reinforce the point that lots of the, the chapters start with a really 
kind of engaging story. They sort of hook you in to the chapter with a, a personal anecdote. And so in that sense, I found it really, really uh, easy to, to read. I've sort of dipped in and out of various sections, but I wanted to dive into the, the chapters that where you, um, you talk about appetite and um, you've got a chapter which is called Hacking the Body. You've got quite a lot of discussion around the junk food cycle. Um, and, and I think this is an area that you've developed a bit further since we worked on the national food strategy. So that's why I was particularly interested to focus in on it. And you talk about the new generation of appetite suppressing drugs, um, semaglutides. And um, I just thought it would be really great if you could just tell us a bit about why, why is appetite so important? And are you, I mean, I suppose that you could look at these appetite drugs. I was looking this morning at the number of people that are on antidepressants, 8.9, 8.3 million people in Britain are on antidepressants. Um, if we had everyone that was obese on, on anti, anti appetite drugs or whatever you call them properly, um, that would be about 13 million people. So it's not like inconceivable that we could go down this route right. of having huge chunks of the population um, or are medicated for uh, to deal with the food environments that they're they're in. I mean, should we give up? Uh, no, I think it's not just not inconceivable. I think it's the more likely thing to happen, and I think it would be bad. Uh, so we mustn't give up. So what we did on appetite, the first thing I didn't think we did enough of in the food strategy was just explain how powerful appetite is, and that's why we use we go back to the the Chilean rugby players from Piers Paul Reed's book Alive who crashed in the Andes and ended up uh, eating the flesh of their friends and family who had died and then eating their brains and their lungs and their livers. And we say like, this is, and then we use the example of the, the Ansel Keys hunger studies where the, the conscientious objectors were starved during the war so they could learn how to refeed people at, at the end of the war. And they lost interest in everything. Uh, all they could think about was food and they'd go to the movies and, yeah, they wouldn't care about the sex. They wouldn't care about the romance. They wouldn't care about the drama. But when a, when a, uh, when they, everyone sat down for a meal, they'd be completely wrapped by the movie. And so we wanted to get the sense of this isn't this isn't a, 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 an instinct that you want to go wrong, um, and it's and it's going wrong because of because of the interaction between the appetite and the commercial incentives of companies. So that's the first thing I wanted, like really to explain that in more detail. And we go into a lot of detail about exactly why that's happening. With semaglutide, uh, we're going to be a Zempic, and there are lots more on their way. So, you know, you can, you can hack, because it's a feedback loop and it's between two things. We didn't really talk about this. So we had assumed you want to improve the food environment, but actually you could change the appetite. And in many ways, changing the appetite is politically easier. We think that... Um, I've heard from a number of civil servants that Steve Barclay is looking at buying you know, millions of, of courses of, uh, of Wigovi. And um, I think that, you know, I, so there's a friend of mine who I talk about in the book who's, who's on Wigovi, has been for a few years, private subscription. And she makes exactly the point you make. She says, we live in a depressing world and people are on antidepressants. You know, would you rather they would suffered? And she says... I have lived all my adult life in misery to do with my weight. I think about food all the time. I'm taking Wagovi and I've been freed up and my life has changed. And I think, you know, if I look at people who are kind of over 35 BMI, who have been miserable all their lives, who have just struggled, uh, I would actually say to them, go and talk to your GP about Wagovi because in the current environment, it's not worth it bearing that pain and they do they do seem very successful although unless you really like, really like your food because they do seem to take pleasure away from from food quite a lot yeah. um uh but but i was talking to susan jeb about this you know fundamentally if you um what you are doing is treating the the, the kind of the symptom the, the getting people on bees and not the cause the cause is the food system and it could go wrong, and there are two ways in which it could go wrong if that's the only thing that we focus on. The first is, as Susan points out, when you roll a drug that has been available to a very small number of people, to a very large number of people, in a short period of time, you can get 
uh, significant tail effects. We saw this with the vaccines, very small probability side effects that multiplied by, well, it, it'll be 13 million here, but you know, if you then add Canada and America and Mexico, it will be millions and millions of people. You could have side effects that actually make the drugs very quickly. People get scared of them, won't take them. And so then you have problems treating the people who really need them. Um, the other thing I worry about is that a bit like w with the Green Revolution, when we solved the problem of starvation by these new crops, if you focus on one thing, something else is going to go wrong in the system down the line. So like, you just don't know what's going to happen. Whereas you do know that if you improve the food system and make people eat better food, then, then so make the food environment better, then, then that will, that will, there aren't, there's no possible downside of that. Yeah. So I think the challenge, I guess, is, I mean, it's, it would be very interesting, I think, to um, talk to the public also about some of the, about the appetite drugs, wouldn't it? Because when we, I think the problem with getting the policy intervention in this into food environments is we all know it's unbelievably hard and the resistance from the food industry is intense. Policymakers use up a lot of political capital getting just small things over the line. Um, I mean, is do we really need, do we think, do you think to kind of properly talk to citizens about these two choices, essentially. I mean, obviously, as you say, it's probably going to be a mixture of both in reality. But the if if we just leave it to appetite drugs, I'm I mean, I, I would imagine that citizens will feel very instinctively opposed to that course of action. I, I think it definitely I, I haven't seen any. I've been looking at it quite a lot and I haven't seen any quant research, any focus yeah. group. Really, I think it'd be a fascinating study to do about and actually kind of again you know what is the electorally because as we know from the from the food strategy there is where the policymakers, for example are probably right to be instinctively nervous about intervention on meat things like uh restricting advertising to children are wildly wildly popular and so i do think that it would be useful to 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 have that conversation with the appetite drugs as part of it Mm, yeah, yeah. So let's move on a little bit to the sort of wider issues around food environments. One of the other additions to the book uh, that didn't make it into the food strategy was your chapter on the power of love, which is a fantastic title for a chapter, of course. Um, but also uh, you're where you dive into um, food culture and also, I mean, it starts with a, a lovely story about Japanese hospital food. Um, but lovely you, story involving me being in hospital. Well, yeah, you were actually do remember the Zoom call with you in hospital where we were discussing <laughs> we something. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, uh, but amazing hospital food in Japan. Um, but you, you sort of emphasise the role that we all play as little cogs in, in the bigger system in terms of when we make a nice meal for our friends and family and we use food um, in great ways to strengthen our social relationships and, and so forth. But I, I was wanted to pick up on, uh, I, I uh, probably mistakenly re uh, read Christopher Snowden's review of the book. Um, I don't know if you've actually I've been, it. I've been emailing back and forth with him over the last yeah, yeah. hour. I thought yeah. you probably wouldn't be able to resist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, you know, much of it's sort of what you'd expect, but um, he did he did have a little poke at Leon in it, in his review, in terms of talking about um, the relative amounts of calories and sugar and salt in Leon yeah. food compared to McDonald's. And I was interested in your reflections on that in the context of the power of love, because you've talked a lot in the past about the fact that companies obviously get stuck in the junk food cycle as well. But how, I suppose I'm interested in this point about how much agency like we really have to try and deal yeah. with some of these issues, whether you're a, an entrepreneur or a parent, you know, I'm, you know, we don't want a message to be entirely disempowering, but at the same time, we need to be realistic about what we can achieve. And I'm just interested in your reflections on that. Yeah, and I'll answer Chris's uh, question in the, in the chat as well about the symbiosis between culture and, and policy. So uh, if you remember, we always wanted to put a, a chapter called The Power of Love into the food strategy, and we never quite got there. 
And I was trying to do two things. The first was trying to give people individual agency because we, um, because at the beginning of the book, we start about it saying, you know, describing how people are cogs in this vast machine that goes goes from the soil right through to the supermarket checkout and is full of all these feedback loops. And we wanted to come back to the individual. We say, you know, you are a, because you're a cog in the machine, you can move the machine. And we talk about all of the things at a local level, how actually any, uh, any you know, good plate of food that's ever been cooked for anyone has been done by someone who cared or loved. And we talk about things you can do in your community, in your school, et cetera. So we want to give people agency there. The second thing we talk about is the point that Chris asks about culture. So I've always thought we have two transitions to make. One is making the ultra processed food better. The second is shifting our culture so that we are we've got less of that stuff in our diets. And everyone thinks that is nuts, you know, instinctively. You know, the, the, the genie's out of the bottle. You're never going to do that. But we then go into examples. We we show with Japan how this culture that everyone thinks of as kind of, you know, innately God-given to Japan and part of their national heritage is actually completely contrived first by the Meiji Meiji dynasty when they opened up in the late 19th century and all the foreigners were like incredibly strong and they they thought, oh my God, we've got to change our diet. And the emperor started eating red meat, which was taboo at the time. Uh, And then they started feeding up the army and they used lots of recipes they stole recipes from around the world so for example katsu curry was copied from uh, the food on on english naval boats it's an english english dish stolen from india that's come to japan and then after the war macarthur went further so you know the the delicious japanese mayonnaise with extra protein is to build you know etc etc so culture is absolutely a combination of what's going in the country and policy and we kind of tried to paint an optimistic picture that we could change culture. In terms of um, businesses, mm. uh, I'm actually quite pessimistic. So, you know, Leon, one of the things with Leon is that we started off wanting to do kind of absolutely fantastic put from home food that was also fast food. And commercially, there were things that we got dragged into because otherwise we would have gone bust. So, for example, we did baked fries, which were better than fried fries, but they were still potato and oil. And we kind of got put, we felt ourselves getting pulled into the junk food cycle. I went to speak at Weetabix's um, uh, last year or the year before at their um, annual manager's day. And they were like, oh, we don't believe in this junk food cycle. And I put up a slide that had their latest uh, product development kind of pipeline, and it was all pen with chocolate in it, Weetabix with sugary coating on the outside, Weetabix with chocolate in it and sugary coating on the outside. And they're kind of, you know, they suddenly realize they're on the outside of the whirlpool getting sucked in. I would say, probably luckily, actually, more, more than anything else, from Kevin Hall's latest works, one of the things about that Leon food, it does seem that hyperpalatability, so the ratio of salt to carbs to sugar, uh, calorie density and lack of high fiber, are the primary, he thinks, are the primary three causes. Mm-hmm. And the Leon food wouldn't have had any of those three things because it's got lots of water and it's got lots of fiber in. But that is actually kind of by the by. That's almost, I mean, well, it's not by the by because we were, it's because we came from one end. It's because we yeah, came yeah. again with that stuff in there. So I think, you know, on, on that, um, on your answer, yes, the power of love, empower people, make us think bigger about changing culture. But I am, I am, The the thing I'm least optimistic about is the ability to change the food companies without without policy, without government intervention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I want to move on to something else now. You've got, um, uh, we've had in the news this week, um, new data being released around um, food insecurity. You've got a great chapter in the book around inequalities. Um, There's been a few things I think it's worth noting. Yesterday, DWP published the latest uh, food insecurity data from their big national survey. Important to note, it's um, a year out of date because of the, you know, the the time that it takes to produce all of that. Um, But still, they're showing uh, that 31% of households in receipt of universal credit are food insecure using their fairly conservative definition. 
We've also had the Health Equals uh, have, has launched, which is a big campaign around uh, health inequality, showing just how wide that uh, life expectancy differences are between, I think the highest was 88 years in Westminster constituency. They've done this constituency based analysis down to 76 years in parts of Glasgow. Wow. Huge differences. Um, I'm interested to get you because at the uh, when we were working on the food strategy, you were quite, you know, you were clear in saying, well, you know, there's only so far I can go in my recommendations, because I'm focusing on the food system. And a big part of this problem is an income problem, which is sort of beyond the scope of what you were able to address. But I'm interested now that you're, you know, removed from that that context. What do you think DWP, you know, is 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 they've got a high number of people that they are helping through the benefit system who are food insecure. What would you be your advice to them in terms of how they think about that that problem? Well, so. The first thing that, uh, as you know, we wanted to do, so we were quite frustrated with this. Oh, but there are people on £50,000 who get free school meals. And so we asked, we wanted to give a segmentation to show a bit like what it was like to be on universal credit, how which people fall in and fall out, who's on there and in the long term, et cetera. And um, Therese, they were going to give us the data and Therese Coffee banned us from having the data which I was furious about at the time, but didn't speak out about publicly for, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, I, I was with Emma Reevey last night and um, the, the, the CEO of Trussell Trust, and she is just doing some work, which I think is the basic minimum. So she's doing some work on what are the essentials. So yeah. they have costed the weekly essentials, toothpaste, soap, uh, food, et cetera. And, uh, they reckon it's about 120 quid, and the for a single person, the universe, starting universal credit is 80 quid. And so I, I do clearly there is something wrong in there. I think you have to be. I mean, the, the, what I wish DWP would do is I think it would be incredibly helpful for society for people to understand a bit more the difference of people on universal credit because for you know the, the arguments on it are so rubbish. Yeah. Uh, oh, they're on £50,000. Oh, but many are in work. You know, that's because a whole part of universal credit is about people who have a crisis and making sure that the crisis doesn't turn into a catastrophe. You know, a lot of people intentionally come in and come out again. So I think there needs to be a much more intelligent discussion on, on universal credit. I'm right, clearly it should support the basic man of universal credit. It should be enough to buy your basic. So I'll be yeah. supporting that campaign when it starts. Yeah, and that's something we're encouraging the uh, Work and Pensions Committee to sort of delve into a little bit more, perhaps in yeah. an inquiry. Okay, we've, got, we've got a few more a few a few more minutes before we close. I'd really like to um, talk, just have a slight moment of reflection, really, from you in terms of um, what do you? Obviously, the food strategy landed in the summer of. 2021 um at that point we weren't in the huge instability of course which followed the following year but this period has been very tumultuous with covid leaving the european union etc cost of living crisis and lots of political movement i'm interested to think to for for, for you to reflect on what conditions could have created a better landing for the food strategy. I'm thinking about that in the context of the work that we organizations like us do in terms of sort of building parliamentary engagement, for example, or other things that might have helped to get some of those, more of those recommendations over the line. And I'm interested in sort of any reflections you have of what you've learned as in your period as a NED. I don't know how long it's been now, five, six years? Or? Five years, five secretaries of state, four prime ministers. Yeah. <laughs> Four, four, no, four walking up the hill to no deal Brexit's and back again, one pandemic and, and a war. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, do you think that accounts for why more and more of the recommendations haven't got over the line? Or do you think there are other factors that we can be sort of really focusing on to make these, create a more fertile environment for these bit, to land? A, a, bit, a, a bit of both. So I actually think we were incredibly lucky with how it landed. And this is how ridiculous politics is. 
But on both part one and part two, uh, uh, there was no other big news on the days we launched. I know that sounds incredibly trivial, but actually that big first burst makes people sit up and take, take notice. And then we were quite lucky with things like Marcus Rashford and you know those sort of things. And actually, if you had said to me at the beginning, what do you think you'll get in place you know, on day one? I wouldn't have been unhappy with where we got to. My reflection, I got two major reflections on the kind of working as a, as a Ned and briefly, and then, and then I'll say what I th where I think we go forward. So one is when you have a complex system problem like this, you really need a strong number 10 and sec settled secretaries of state to deal with it. So I, I was talking to Michael Barber, who ran the health reforms for, for Blair, you know, when they got the waiting list right down. And it was just like the, the level of stability in that government enabling you to be serious about long term prospects. So you need that, I think, to have really serious things. The other is I was surprised. I was I thought that the lobbying at the food companies was more pernicious than I had imagined it would be when I started. In terms of what we can do, I think the biggest thing that can be done now is manifestos and getting into people's manif depoliticizing stuff to make sure it gets into both manifestos. And uh, to, to, to um, Louise's point about how, you know, how we can campaign, I think a combination of not just being angry and shouting and saying terrible numbers, but giving those terrible numbers in the terms of stories about people's lives is very powerful. And then tweeting both sides of the argument at the moment as if they are fellow travellers trying to solve these problems, not bastards who aren't doing anything about it. You know, the, the, we've got a big opportunity now to get things into to, to manifestos, and that is the way I think you do it. Henry, thank you so much. We've reached the end. Um, you've done really an incredible job in your leadership over your time at NED and continuing going forward on the food system change agenda. I know many of us are uh, very grateful for all the leadership and time and effort that you've put into this. Um, we will make more progress. I've no doubt about that. And congratulations on Ravenous. Um, thanks very much. And everybody, if you'd like, there will be a recording of this. If you want to share, share it with uh, friends and colleagues, um, please do so. Thanks very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.